I'm in Washington, D.C., walking to the heart of our nation's capital. As I stand among these icons, I can't help but think on the foundational values that shape our identity. Faith, freedom, family, hard work, property ownership, financial cautiousness, our right to defend ourselves, leadership, civic duty, value of life, care for the poor, justice for the victim, and maybe above all, self-sacrifice. In our nation today, there are those who have been told they must sacrifice their liberty in order to truly have equality. This is a lie. There are imposters among us who seek power by dividing our society into the privileged and the underprivileged. This division only breeds irrational fear, chaos, and hatred, exactly what the enemy uses to exploit and control us. The only antidote for our society is truth, and it begins by understanding that equality is the outcome of liberty. Any society that takes away liberty simultaneously causes inequality. Every generation must fight for its liberty, and ours is no different. And in the process, we will find equality, dignity, and opportunity for all. And ultimately remember, true liberty and equality are found only in Jesus Christ. About two weeks ago, about 45 of us, some of you were there, we took a tour to our nation's capital. It was a two-day tour, and primarily we went to visit the, uh, our Bible Museum. And then our bus driver, he took us down Constitution Avenue and Independence Avenue, and we were able to see the other memorials, uh, like uh, the Jefferson Memorial or the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial there. You can see them from a distance. And every time I go... I don't know about you, but I'm always struck by the beauty, by the grandeur. Uh, I'm always struck by the foundational values like faith and family and freedom and all the rest of the values that I mentioned in the video. Unfortunately, those values are being actively eroded for quite some time. And the imposters are promising a very different America. They're promising a better America. and we, especially as Christians, have to wake up and realize what is really at stake. And today's message in our series to the book of Judges is titled, Imposter. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Judges, chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Judges, chapter 9, and verse 1. The main point of our message is this. We are living in a time when the wicked are doing everything possible to gain power and spread an agenda. It's a wicked agenda. It's an evil agenda. And those who stand for biblical values are often accused of being Christian nationalists. As Christians, when we hear that, we keep backing away or remaining silent, and the imposters keep marching on and they gain more ground. Not just ground among people of like-mindedness, but also ground in the church. Because the church doesn't understand how to respond and how to sift through all the voices that are coming at us. It's high time that we stand for the truth. Standing for the truth does not mean we go out there with guns blazing. Standing for the truth is not punching and hitting. Standing for the truth is knowing the truth and speaking out. Standing for the truth means knowing the truth and countering the lies when you hear them. At stake are our foundational values and the future of our nation. And ultimately, God will deal with the wicked and His truth will prevail. Judges chapter 9, verse 1. Then Abimelech, the son of Jeroboam, went to Shechem. 
to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem, which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jerubal reign over you or that one reign over you? Remember that I am your flesh and bone. And his mother's brother spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem, and their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. Then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the 70 sons of Jerubal, on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, was left because he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together, all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the Tirbin tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. Now, if you've been in this series, you know how Gideon made this ephod. Remember, after he was done fighting the enemy, they came to him and said, we're going to make you king. We're going to make your sons, your grandsons kings. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. But then he made this ephod. Ephod was this high priest's garment made out of gold, precious stones. And he set it up to tell them that I am not God. Neither was this God. What he was saying is, God used me. God put me on as a clothing. God is God. And God is your king. So the first generation understood that this ephod, this this high priest apron, was a representation of how God will use anybody. Anybody who wants to let God put them on, they can be used. But then unfortunately, as you know, they began to worship the ephod. They began to worship that golden apron. And that's where they went downhill. But he made this, and he lived for 40 more years, never wanting to be the king. And then he died. What happened when he died? Listen to Judges chapter 8 and verse 30. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son whose name he called Abimelech. Abimelech means, my father is the king. Everybody hear that? Most of y'all have been coming to this series. Do you find a problem with it? What have I been saying throughout this series? Throughout this series, I've been saying that judges are the... Good guys, thank you. One person actually answered. Throughout this series, I've been saying, the book of Hebrews that came much later says that they obtained a good testimony through faith. Gideon had many wives. Gideon had a concubine. Gideon then named the son of a concubine, my father is the king. What's going on with that? How can Pastor Shah keep saying that the judges are, a, are the good guys? How can he keep saying that they have a good testimony through faith? That's not a good testimony. Keep reading Judges chapter 8 and verse 32. Now Gideon the son of Joash died at a good old age. You know, in the Hebrew, the phrase is Be'sebatov. Be'sebatov is not good old age. It is with good gray hair. Twice in the Old Testament, you find that phrase with good gray hair. One was with Abraham. When Abraham died, he died with good gray hair. And how old was Abraham when he died? 175 years old. And the other person it says that about is David. He died with good gray hair. How old was David? Probably about 80 years old. 
So more than likely, stay with me, after Gideon won the victory, he lived for 40 years, which means more than likely Gideon was about 40 or 50 years old when he had an encounter with God. To say it in a better way, he was 40 to 50 years old when he got saved, when he met Jesus Christ. All those extra wives and their concubine and then naming a son from the concubine, my father is a king, was his pre-Jesus Christ life. Don't raise your hand. How many of y'all have a pre-Jesus Christ life? You get the point. The pre-Jesus Christ life where he, he was a womanizer. He took many wives. That was expressly what God had said to the people of Israel, you cannot do. In his pre-Jesus Christ life, he had this concubine and even named that son. Do you really think Gideon would ever name the son of a concubine, my father is king, when repeatedly he says, I don't want to be your king, God is your king. He even builds an ephod to say, look, look, God uses people, not me. And if at any point in time, if he was going to name his concubine son, concubine means this just a woman he took, not even married. If any point in time he wanted to be a king for those 40 years, he would have been, he could have done it. He didn't do that, which means this is his pre-Christ life. Many of us have a pre-Christ life. And in that pre-Christ life, decisions were made where, where you did not have the Holy Spirit guiding you. And if you're truly honest, don't again, don't raise your hand. Many of us have a lot of regrets because those are the pre-Jesus Christ life. Years ago, I knew a couple and they had four children. And they talked to Nicole and I one time and they were up in age. They had four children. Two of them were born and almost eight, 10 years of age, maybe even older, when they got saved. And the other two were born after they got saved. There was a distinct difference between those two sets of kids. One set were, we remember the old mom and dad. They would party, they would cuss, they would do whatever. Sundays was our day. And then all of a sudden, mom and daddy found Jesus, and now we got to go to church. In a sense, they resented church. Unfortunately, they still do. And then there were the other two, the post-Jesus, you know, children who love the Lord. This is great. We go to church. We love Jesus. This is wonderful. Mom and dad are faithful. What is happening? The pre and the post. What is happening with Gideon, all those wives and their concubine and even naming a son, my father is king. This is the pre-Jesus Gideon. Now here's where I want to go quickly because there's much I have to cover this morning. Satan will put a guilt trip on you for your pre-conversion life. And constantly he will bring you this thought. Don't miss this. You're here this morning. Stay awake. Stay alert. Constantly he'll bring you this thought. If you could only go back. If you could go back and fix that. If you could, folks, listen, you cannot, no matter how hard you try, ever time travel. You can't do that. But he will play that tape on repeat. If you only you could go back, if only you could fix, if only that hadn't happened, he will use that. Here's what, re realize at that moment, Satan is speaking to you. Reject him. Reject him and immediately pray to God and say, God, you are sovereign. You're in control. I didn't know that. That happened. But God, I know that you will work all things together for good. Immediately, Satan has to go. But he won't stay gone long. He's going to come back and say again, if only, if only. What I want us to understand is Satan wants us to live in regret. We need to trust God's promises. If you have that pre-conversion life, trust God's promise that he will still work all things together for good in his timing. Unfortunately, Gideon's son through this concubine, he hatched a wicked scheme to become the king. After his father died, he said, you know, I'm going to be the king. 
And so he goes to his uncles in his hometown, in his city of Shechem. He goes to his uncles and says, look, what's going to happen is this. My father, Jerubal. See, that's very significant. He doesn't call his dad Gideon. He calls him Jerubal. Jerubal means the Baal killer. The Baal killer has just died. He has 70 sons. They're going to come after you. Now, daddy didn't want to be a king and all that, but I know for sure those 70 are going to come and they're going to attack us and they're going to fight against us and they're going to make us worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're going to force their religion on us. They're going to make us keep all these Old Testament laws that Moses gave. Hey, look, you know, that's what those 70 will do. I got a plan. I'm also the son of Jerubal. Yeah, yeah, my mom was a concubine. He never married her, but I have the same blood running through me. So if you make me king, then I will rule over you. And if, if I am the king, I'm also your brother. You, see, you're like me. I'm like you. We're one. I understand what you're going through. I'll fight for you. I'll be there for you. And so what did these people do? The men of Shechem, they said, okay, that sounds good. He, he was broke, by the way. They took 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal, and they gave it to Abimelech, and he hired worthless and ruthless men. He went out there and killed all his brothers except one. I want you to hear me carefully. Imposters, imposters. Abimelech was an imposter. They will use every means to gain power. They will lie. They will manipulate. They will manipulate the media to craft out a narrative that will breed fear and hatred. The bail killers are coming. The bail killers are coming. They're going to force their, you know, this Old Testament faith on you. They will tell you how much they are just like you and how much they understand you, where you're coming from. I understand because I grew up like that. Hand me your liberties and I will bring you equality. Hey, do you want 70 to rule or just one? Give me all your freedoms and I will make everybody equal. And in America right now, and for some time, has this, this, this slogan of equality, equity, whatever you want to say, it, it's, this is this thing. Hand me the liberty, and I will make sure everybody has equal opportunity. Everybody has equal chance. That's what Abimelech was saying. Give me your liberties, and I will bring equality. In truth, equality is the outcome of liberty. If you really study the history of America... The people who came, remember how I talked about the different people from different parts of England came here? They had two things in common, equality and liberty. Someday I'll, I'll, I'll preach on that and help you understand how that works. Any society that is taking away liberty is simultaneously causing inequality. It's a Marxist socialist idea. Give us your freedom. And I'll make sure everybody is on the same level. Only problem is behind the curtain, there's a huge disparity between those who are in charge and those who are not. When you hand in the liberties, it seems like, yes, for the greater good, when we all be equal, let's hand in our liberties because this person will make it all fair. In the process, we're actually causing more inequality. So every generation must fight for liberty, and ours is no different. And in the process, you will find equality, and that's what the founding fathers were doing. Liberty and equality. In the process, when we fight for liberty, we also find equality and dignity and opportunity for all. But here's what happens. The moment you fight for liberty, they will try to slander you. 
They will start to slander anyone who stands in the way. And the new narrative has been for a few years against Christian is that we are trying to bring Christian nationalism into America. How many of you heard the, the phrase Christian nationalism? You haven't? I mean, y'all live in an island somewhere? Christian nationalism. Sometime back, someone asked me that question. So what do you think of Christian nationalism? I didn't know why they were asking that. I was like, well, you know I mean, it's, you know, I understand what you mean by that, but why do you ask? They said, well, I mean, are you a Christian nationalist? I was like, Christian nationalist? Why would you ask me that question? I'm just asking, I just want to know, are you, because I feel like you may be. I said, Christian nationalist. Do you know what a Christian nationalist could be? You know, and back in 2020, there was a book that came out. It's called Taking America Back for God. Christian nationalism in the United States. And the authors of this book Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry, they define Christian nationalism like this. They said it's an ideology that tries to superimpose a type of Christianity on America. They try to superimpose a type of Christianity on on America, which includes assumptions of nativism. What is nativism? Nativism has nothing to do with Native Americans, by the way. Nothing to do with indigenous people. Native Americans means you're favoring native-born people over immigrants. So when that person called me a Christian nationalist, I was like, you think I'm a nativist? I guess I'm doing better with my accent than I realized. Don't you see me confusing my V's and W's? Don't you see me stutter at times because I'm trying to go from British English to American English? Can't you tell I wasn't born and raised? Okay, anyways, nativism. This definition goes on. It also means white uh, supremacy. Like, maybe we're in the sunlight. It's really bright, but I guess he can't tell my color. I, last I checked, I wasn't white. Patriarchy. Uh, patriarchy means men have the majority of power and privilege. Christian nationalism. But that is very simple. He's never met my wife. I have very little power and authority. I lead the church. I try to lead my family spiritually. But if I ever try to dominate my wife, she'll kill me. You know, (laughs) it's not works like that. Heteronormativity. Heteronormativity says heterosexuality is the norm. We can debate that. Along with, this definition keeps going, along with divine sanction for authoritarian control. Christian nationalism means you're trying to turn over all your power over to somebody and you're all going to bow and say, please rule us. Last I checked, all of us want what? You're not going to dominate us. We have our freedom. We're going to stand free. America means we have freedom. Anybody here wants to be dominated? Any? Raise your hand. We can have a conversation later. I'll help you out. It's not a good thing. This definition goes on that it also uh, means um, militarism. Militarism means using the military to defend or promote national interests. I mean, we just go over and take whatever country we want for ourselves. Anybody here want to do that? I mean, usually go and help people who are in need, and sometimes we do a great job, sometimes we don't do a great job. It all depends on which government is in and which government is out. It is as ethnic and political as it is religious. What I'm telling you is this is the definition by these two individuals of Christian nationalism. Understood in this light, Christian nationalism contends that America has been and should always be distinctively Christian from top to bottom in its self-identity, interpretations of its own history, sacred symbols, cherished values, public policies, and it aims to keep it that way. Mark David Hall professor at George Fox University, gave a wonderful rebuttal of this definition. 
And I agree with him, and I have certain other points, but, but I'm going to summarize that very quickly. We should be patriotic as Americans. Everybody agree on that? Anybody has a problem? with uh, We should be patriotic as Americans. Having said that, our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Anybody here believes that, oh, no, this is it? No. Yes, we're patriotic, but ultimately, he is our Lord. As Christians, we believe that every person should be treated with dignity and respect, whether we agree with them or not. Anybody here feels like we just need to go out and punch people? I mean, we feel like sometimes, but no. You see, I don't know some of y'all wondering, what happened to Abimelech? You were talking about that. What Abimelech was doing was he was mischaracterizing his, his half-brothers as bail killers, that's what's happening in America. Christians are being mischaracterized and are being mischaracterized as being the nationalist. All they want to do is make this America become this Old Testament law society. To say that America was founded as a Christian nation is not the same as saying that America is for Christians only. It's a fact of history, folks, that this nation was founded by people who were operating from a biblical foundation, from a Judeo-Christian foundation. The reason America works is because the foundation principles of equality, liberty are coming from the Bible. America was founded as a Christian nation. Does not mean that America is for Christians only. He said, what the history, history, what, wait a minute. History? Unless you're listening to some Marxist professor, unless you're listening to some YouTube or some TikTok video who's teaching you history, let's go to history. George Washington, first president, right? He wrote a letter to the Jewish congregation in Rhode Island, Rhode, this was a synagogue, assuring them that they will have the right to worship the way they desire. This is in the 1780s, 90s. He is telling Jewish people, you have the right to worship the way you want. Do you want to know how many Jewish people were in America at the time? 2,000. He was assuring them, hey, listen, you also have a place in this society. Christ Christianity was the foundation of our nation. You have a place in the society. When somebody accuses you of Christian nationalism, they are mischaracterizing not only us, but also the history of our nation. Yes, there are people who have held to views that may be considered as Christian nationalism. Uh, people like Rusas Rushduni. How many of you have read works by Rusas Rushduni? How can you be a good Christian nationalist if you haven't read any books by Rushduni? How many of you even heard of the name Rushduni? My point exactly. There are people out there who, who are dominion theology. You heard of dominion theology? You heard of reconstructionist theology? Some of you may have heard that one. But they hardly have a following. Many of them are a little crazy. Uh, some of the things they include is, uh, in their views is capital punishment for witchcraft. Anybody here wants to take a stone and stone some witches today? You don't? Anybody want to go and stone gay and lesbian people today? Anybody want to go and stone juvenile delinquents? Don't answer that. Maybe you do, but that's a different, that's a different problem. What I want us to understand is this, even those people who are these, these uh, Christian nationalists or Reconstructionists, when, the, when they're saying that we want to bring this Old Testament law, they're not talking about now, they're talking about in the post-millennial period. Post-millennialism says this world is going to get better and better and better, and then we're going to put all these Old Testament laws in place, and Jesus is coming. If you believe that this world is getting better and better, you have room upstairs to rent. Unfurnished. This world is getting worse and worse. Now, we need to make this world a better place, amen? We need to make this world a better place. Having said that, this world is not getting better and better. 
How many people actually believe this stuff? Not many. And yet we are told, this is who you are. Now, how many times have you heard me say from the pulpit, vote biblical values? You, you heard me say that? rest of y'all haven't? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah, you heard me say that. When I'm saying that, what I'm saying is choose life for the unborn. When I say vote biblical values, I'm saying support traditional marriage. When I say vote biblical values, I'm saying let kids pray in school. When I say vote biblical values, I'm saying protect our children. Don't let outsiders take parental rights away and implement on them surgeries and things of that sort that even Europe is saying, I think we made some mistakes. When we're saying vote biblical values, we're saying you should be rewarded for hard work. Vote biblical values means you have the freedom of religion. Oh, you're a Christian nationalist. That's when pastors back up, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not crazy. Okay, well, I'm not going to say that from the pulpit. What's tragic right now is, prior to the Revolutionary War, pastors were preaching from their pulpit and telling people, hey, stand for the truth, fight for the truth. Many times those same pastors would leave the pulpit and join the army and become chaplains. And today, the pulpits are eerily silent. And anytime someone even steps out, guess what? Here's the problem. It's not the lost people who tell me these things. Sometimes it's church folks who will say that. Well, you know, I don't know. What do you, I mean, I, I don't know. you should keep that, not say that in church. Lost world doesn't have a problem. Church folks with limited understanding are willing to say, but that sounds like Christian nationalism. What is very funny, actually, they asked similar questions about faith in America, and about 65% of African Americans got characterized as Christian nationalists. And they're like, what, what? That doesn't work. And they went back and looked, oh, wait, wait, they're saying we need justice in America uh, from the Bible. But you see how this, this whole lie that has been perpetrated, just like Abimelech did. Oh, those people are coming. The bail killers are coming. The same lie is being used against Christians that you want, to, you want to implement and force your religion down our throat. That's what you're trying to do. When that is far from the truth. Well, how about places like Charlottesville in August 2017? when white supremacists and alt-right people showed up? What about January 2021, where there were some people there who assaulted the Capitol? Where were those people Christian nationalists? Sure. But that is even more reason for godly, Bible-believing Christians to stand up and say, they're not with us. That's not us. What many people have done, uh, unfortunately, is we have abandoned our position will become very silent. That's why the other side keeps growing and keeps using the same rhetoric, and Christians are just, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to be mislabeled. Uh, that's not me. You know, the Bible tells us you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What I'm trying to do this morning in the limited, limited time I have is to tell you the truth shall set us free. My old professor used to say, don't let the enemy define you. Don't let the enemy put a label on you and then say, that's who you are. You're saying, well, that's not me, but okay, I guess that's fine. Throw it off. Say, that's not me. You are mischaracterizing who we are. So what Abimelech did is... He mischaracterized his brothers. He goes over there with his worthless and reckless followers, and they slaughter 69 of his half-brothers on one stone. By the way, being on one stone, which means this was a human sacrifice. This was a sacrifice to Baal. 
And only one escaped and the youngest one, and his name was Jotham. Now listen to what he says. Jotham cries out to the men of Shechem. Like some of us need to cry out. Listen to what Jotham says in Judges 9-7. Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. And then he gives a parable, like a story. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, should I cease giving oil? With which they honor God and men and go to sway over trees. Means, means I got better things to do. I don't want to do that. Then the tree said to the fig tree, you come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, should I seize my sweetness and my good fruit and go to sway over trees? Then the tree said to the vine, you come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, should I seize my new wine which cheers both God and men and go to sway over trees? It means all the trees like the, the olive and the fig and the vine, like the grapevine are saying, we're doing other things. We don't need to control and rule you. We don't have time for that. Then all the trees said to the bramble. You know what a bramble is? It's a thorny bush. It means nothing left but a thorny bush. And they said, you come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. Come under the thorny bush. Now, how much shelter will you find under a thorny bush? But here's a threat. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. means if you don't, then we will tear things down. You know, cedars are very tall trees. What it's saying is, we're going to burn everything down. Does that sound like where we are in America? If we don't go a certain way, cities will be burning. You see, I'm not the most courageous person. But don't you think this needs to be talked about? I'm not here telling you vote for this candidate and not. What I'm telling you is open your eyes and see the truth. Open your eyes and recognize the rhetoric, the lies that are being perpetuated, and see for yourself, is this really true? Now begins the downfall of Abimelech very quickly, Judges 9.22. In just three years, he tears everything down. He destroys it all. And verse 23, God is still in control. He sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And they tried to get rid of Abimelech, but they couldn't. He was too powerful now. Then they got a guy named Gal in verse 26, Judges 9, 26. So now Gal, the son of Abed, came with his brothers and he went over to Shechem and the men of Shechem put their confidence in him. They're thinking he's going to get rid of Abimelech. Only problem is, God was too weak. Couldn't do it. Listen to verse 41. Judges 9, 41. Then Abimelech dwelt at Aruma, and Zebul drove out Gaul and his brothers so that they would not dwell in Shechem. I mean, cities began to be overrun by gangs and thugs. Does that sound familiar? Verse 42, and it came about the next day, the people went out into the field. Why do you think they go into the field? They go into the field to, what do you do? You work, you farm. They're going into the field to, to do this, and they told Abimelech, listen to what he does in verse 43, so he took his people, divided them into three companies, and he lay in wait in the field. Means what? We're not going to let you work. You know what is happening in America? If those who have eyes and ears to hear, and willingness to stay awake is very textbook. What happened 3,000 years ago has happened many times and is happening again in our world today. All you got to do is read and go, wow. One by one, the motivation to work is being taken away. How are we going to get food? You'll find it. 
Abimelech did exactly what is happening today. And so listen to verse 45. Uh, Verse 44, then Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city, and the other two companies rushed upon all who were in the fields and killed him. Are you going to work? You're going to, can't do that. Trust in the government. We'll take care of you. So Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He took the city, killed the people who were in it, and he demolished the city and did something else. He sowed it with salt. When you sow a field with salt, you're pretty much killing uh, any opportunity to grow anything. Does that sound like where we are in America? It means the, 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 the desire to be creative, take initiative, build a business is just being taken away. What is left? Why should I even do that? I just... Just sit back and just wait. Now, verse 46, when all the men of the tower of Shechem had heard that they entered the stronghold of the temple of the god Bereath, it was told Abimelech that the the leaders of the city have gone into this tower. Tower was like a protective place, and they ran in there. Guess what Abimelech did? Verse 48, then Abimelech took an axe in his hand cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder. And he said to the people who were with him, what you see me do, do with me. So each of the people likewise cut down his own bough, followed Abimelech, put them against the stronghold and set the stronghold on fire. And he burned those people alive. How many people? About a thousand men and women. Means you're going to oppose me, you will die. Now, don't forget, God has a way of turning the enemy's sword against himself. And it happens in verse 50. He goes to another city. The name of the city is Tebes, and he tries to take the city. And they also had a strong tower. They also had a place where the people could go in and be safe. And they run in there, all the men and women, all the people of the city. They fled there. They shut themselves in, and they went up to the top of the tower So Abimelech came as far as the tower and fought against it. Who is he fighting against? Not the enemy army or anything. He's fighting against common people. He's fighting against unarmed citizens. And then God is in control. Verse 53 He tried to burn this tower, but a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Well, that's interesting. Does that sound familiar? You see, that's exactly what happened to Sisera. Remember the woman jailed? She took a nail and a hammer and put it right through his head. Why the head? Because both Sisera and Abimelech are a type of, of the Antichrist. In Genesis 3.15, it says, God cursed the serpent, saying, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall strike his heel, which means he will bruise your head. means one day Jesus will bruise the head of the serpent. Both Sisera and Abimelech were a type of the Antichrist, a son of serpent, Satan. But he's not dead. Listen to what happens here. He's still alive. And so he turns to his armor bearer and says, please kill me. Again, this tells us how God uses the enemy's weapon against himself. And then he dies. There are a lot of voices that are shouting for our attention, especially right now. Some are voices of truth. And some are imposters. Unfortunately, the imposter voices are louder and more threatening. What will you believe? Where will you stand? It's sad for me to see the church more silent than we've ever been. And I think for a reason, it's because we're afraid. We're afraid. 
And we're afraid because of many reasons, but most importantly, to be mislabeled. So I'm not going to say anything. Does this sound familiar? Anybody else with me or are you just? We're afraid to be mislabeled. So I'm just not going to say anything. And Abimelech keeps gaining power. Keeps gaining power. And ultimately, Jesus is the truth. In him, we find true liberty. In Jesus, we find true equality. You see, Jesus said in John 8, 36, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If you don't have that liberty, you're not going to have anything else in this life. Galatians 3.28 also says, There is no, neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. People are looking for equality. True equality comes through Jesus Christ. And this morning, I don't know where you are, but I'm praying, number one, that God will open your eyes to the truth of what is happening in our nation. Secondly, I'm praying that if you do not know Jesus Christ, that you will give your heart to him. That's the greatest need you have. True liberty is found in Christ. True equality is found in Jesus Christ. And how do you receive Jesus Christ? You ask him to come into your life, to forgive you of your sins, and take over. Never done that. Today's the day.